The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. This is Patty Hunter, Patty's Page, all the way over here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Today on my Zoom, a special guest named Dr. Michael New. He is with Charlotte Lozier Institute. He's a speaker and also an author. Wow, you wear a lot of hats, eh? Yep, definitely. Keep, keep you out of trouble. <laughs> Well, welcome to my show, Michael. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So we'll start off with where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, that's where I grew up. Uh, I've moved away, but my mom and dad still live there. And I do try to visit whenever I can. That's good. It's good to she's still around, eh? Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, who influenced you the most when you were growing up? I would say, you know, my parents were probably the best influence on me growing up. You know, uh, they uh, always expected a lot out of me, you know, which oh, yeah. I thought was, was very important. Uh, you know, they really invested heavily in my education. You know, they, uh, you know, really made it well known that they expect me to get really good grades in school. Uh, they expect me to stay out of trouble. Uh, and, yeah, they just set uh, high standards for me, and uh, you know they were good examples in both their professional and personal lives, and had a, had a good impact on me. And you did behave yourself as you were growing up. I mean, teenage boys get into trouble here and there, but I think there I was pretty go. well behaved. You know, nobody <laughs> is perfect, but you know, I think I did I'm not well. perfect either. Far from it. I, where did you go to school? Let's see. Uh, you know, went to Catholic grade school and a Catholic high school. Went to Central Catholic High School in Pittsburgh. Uh, our alumni include uh, Dan Marino, who's a quarterback for the Miami Dolphins. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Zach Quinto, who played Spock in the, some of the Star Trek movies. Uh, for undergrad, I went to Dartmouth College. I graduated there in 1997. And I have both a master's degree in statistics and a PhD in political science from Stanford. And I left Stanford in 2002. Wow. You graduated and all... So your major was? Well, at Dartmouth, my major, I did two majors. I did government, which is what we kind of call political science. And then I did kind of an economics, math combination major. Uh, so when Dartmouth wrapped up, I jumped head first to a PhD program. I started at Stanford that fall. Uh, I got a master's degree in statistics at Stanford and a PhD in political science. So when you graduated, what, what was your first job then? Well, after I left Stanford, uh, I moved to Boston. I had a couple jobs there. I had a research job at Harvard. I was a, a fellow at a place called the Harvard MIT Data Center. Uh, there, my job was kind of helping people do quantitative social science research, you know, mm -hmm. downloading data sets, help with stats packages, some, you know, light statistical consulting. Uh, during my time in Boston, I also taught as an adjunct professor at University of Massachusetts, Boston. So did a couple things in, in Boston. Hey, you you got a lot of hats, kiddo. Yep. A lot. So what do you do right now? I do many things. Uh, I do a lot of writing and research on uh, the social science of the pro-life movement. Yes. I write about things like abortion trends. I write about the impact of pro-life laws. I write about contraception programs. I write about public opinion. So... Uh, you can see me on places like National Review Online, uh, on Life News, on LifeSite News, on Live Action News, writing about these topics when, when things come up. Uh, I also uh, am a sidewalk counselor. I uh, run the uh, Washington, D.C. 
40 Days for Life campaign, and I help coordinate uh, sidewalk counseling outside the Washington, D.C. Planned Parenthood. So those are kind of the two major pro-life ministries that I'm, I'm engaged in. We have a Planned Parenthood thing here in Fort Wayne. It's kind of sad. Chemical, what they do. Yep. So you teach? Yeah, I full time I'm a professor. Uh, I teach actually economics here at the Catholic University of America. I right. teach different economics classes to our business students. So I teach uh, microeconomics. I teach macroeconomics. I teach a class on the federal budget, and I teach game theory. Wow. Can you share uh, some of the other jobs over the years, like a lecture sure. or, or what, workshop? For my first, yeah, first really full-time professor job, I was at University of Alabama. I was there from 2004 to 2011, teaching political science there. Mm -hmm. uh, after Alabama, I moved to Michigan. Uh, I took a faculty position at University of Michigan Dearborn. Um, Michigan is the main campus in Ann Arbor. Uh, less well known, they have the branch campuses in Flint and Dearborn. And I was on the Dearborn campus. I was there until 2015. Then after that, I took a faculty position at Ave Maria. And that was a bit of a shift for me. I Ave Maria, I started teaching economics for the first time. I kind of saw that uh, the job market for economics faculty was better than the job market for political science faculty. And a lot of Catholic schools had trouble finding economists with a good technical skill set. Um, essentially, if you're into the Catholic faith and you're an academic, you're probably a theologian. You might like yeah. philosophy or art or history. You probably are not an economist. There's not that many of us out there. No. So I took a, a job at Ave Maria. I was there for three years. And then uh, in 2018, um, that summer, I left. I accepted a faculty position here at the Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America here in Washington, D.C., and I've been here ever since. Cool. So what do you do at Charlotte Lozier Institute? I am a senior associate scholar. Uh, essentially, it's a good story. They uh, We always needed the pro-life think tank. Uh, that for a long time, the only real research organization working on abortion was the Guttmacher Institute. And Guttmacher, up until 2006 or 2007, was the research arm of Planned Parenthood. So everything they put out had a very strong pro-abortion, pro-contraception bias. There were individual pro-life researchers, but as I put it, we were a ragtag group. We weren't organized. So in 2011, uh, the low Institute started. And we basically want to be a pro-life think tank. And we have scholars with expertise in public health, in law, in bioethics. Uh, you know, I handle all the social science. So I was actually very flattered. I was actually the first scholar they put on board. So about 12 years ago, uh, Lozier was me, uh, Chuck Donovan, who's still our president, and Chuck's assistant, a woman named Laura Sullivan. So there used to be three of us. Now there's about 10, 11 full-time employees and about 50 to 60 associate scholars. So we've really come a long way in a short period of time. So we provide research on sanctity of life issues, again, public health, bioethics, law. Um, again, I handle the social science. We try to cover as much ground as we can. You know, um, I like to, uh, with my TV show, I like to be a part of Charlotte uh, Lozier Institute. That, to give out information when you have to share with the public because I love sharing very, very much. So pro-life uh, issues and uh, how we can fight against uh, this Planned Parenthood and abortion, of course. Yep. Now we can try to provide, you know, good information. Uh, if you're on Twitter, you can follow Lozier, uh, at Lozier Institute. Uh, we're also on Facebook. You know, we do try to be engaged in kind of contemporary debates. You know, we do try to respond quickly to studies that pro-abortion groups like Guttmacher put out. So, again, it's been a, a good tool, a good resource to the pro-life movement, and I'm uh, very happy to be on, on board. You are also a sidewalk counselor? That is correct. Doing how? Well, as a sidewalk counselor, you know, I basically – try to offer alternatives to abortion to women and couples entering the D.C. Planned Parenthood. So, um, you know, essentially there's a group of us that uh, go out on Saturday mornings. Some people pray. 
Uh, some of us try to engage people as they come in. Uh, and it's just kind of interesting how I got involved with that, uh, that, uh, you know, I was always pro-life and I was got involved with the research around, uh, you know, 2004. Um, but uh, and, you know, I was aware of sidewalk counseling and street level activism, but didn't really feel called to get involved until around 2006 or so. And I right. remember I was reading a book called um, Wrath of Angels. And it's about kind of the history of street level activism in the pro-life movement. Uh -huh. It details like Operation Rescue. It details things that went on even before then. And uh, something just clicked when I read the book. I just kind of realized, you know, Michael, if abortion is as wrong and as unjust and is as evil as you think it is, you just can't fight this behind the desk. You have to actually be there where the action is happening. And uh, at this time, I was really conflicted. I was a tenure track professor at the University of Alabama, and there was an abortion clinic in town. But I was scared. I was afraid, well, if I go to the clinic, I run into a student of mine. Or what if I run into a colleague of mine? Well, if they file a grievance against me, a complaint. I mean, the University of Alabama, you know, is not necessarily a conservative institution. You know, uh, right. you know there are a lot of uh, people with liberal political views who work there. So I was worried. Um, but then after a while, I kind of realized, you know, Michael, if God's calling you to do something, you, know, you should do it. You know, God will take good care of you. And I know that um, I was advisor, the faculty advisor of the pro-life group, and they were invited to do like a prayer vigil. So then I said, Michael, just go to the vigil. You know, if you're there with your group, if something does happen, you can just say, look, I'm faculty advisor. You know, my students are here. I wanted to be there to support them. So I hit the clinic and it wasn't that bad. You know, you know, the sky wasn't falling. You know, there wasn't <laughs> pandemonium. And I thought, you know, Michael, you're capable of standing outside a clinic and praying. This is something you can do. So I kept going. And um, interestingly, as I said before, I was worried that, uh, you know, I, I would run into somebody who might file a complaint. It never happened. Uh, during my time in Alabama, I never ran into one of my students uh, outside the clinic. I did run into one colleague. But here's a funny story. He liked what I was doing. He pulled over and said, that, yeah, the people come out here and pray. You're doing something really good. Keep it up. So uh, I thought that was heartening. So uh, uh, the one colleague who I did encounter uh, thought well of our activities. So I thought that... Uh, um, you know, that was, that was a good thing. Well, 40 Days for Life started several days ago till November the 5th. Yep. Yep. So I'm going to try, if, if I, I have trouble walking and all, I do my praying in the house while others go to the Planned Parenthood area here in Fort Wayne. You know, the campaign started yesterday. Um, so we had our, our kickoff rally, uh, not this past Sunday, but last Sunday. Yeah. We had Ramon Trevino, who was an ex-Planned Parent manager uh, and had a powerful conversion to the pro-life cause. She's a full-time pro-lifer now. Yeah. She spoke. Uh, Steve Carlin and Don Crawford from the 40 Your Life team both spoke. Uh, my good friend, Catherine Glenn Foster, uh, who's also a scholar with me uh, right. at the Sir Lizard Institute, she spoke. And then we also had some students, a student from actually a recent alumnus, I should say, from Georgetown, and a couple of students from CUA, even a freshman. Uh, one young lady, three weeks into her freshman year, speaking at a pro life rally. So, so good, good for her. I interviewed um, someone from uh, London, England, their 40 Days for Life, Rob, yep. as well as Steve Harlan himself, yep. and Sean. Yep. So I interviewed them already. I interviewed uh, Abby Johnson. Oh, terrific. She's beautiful. So you have someone there by the name of David. Uh, he's he's in, uh, talking about bioethics as well as um, the uh, vaccine we were talking about. I'm telling uh, David, you. You mean David Prentice? Yes. I interviewed him several times, and uh, Frank Pavone. Yep. So I've been on. I've been doing this for fourteen years, my friend. Great. Yeah. Do you have uh, a show, podcasts, or what? No, I don't have a show. Uh, I may be guest hosting a radio show. Uh, there's a show called Winds of Change. Broadcast on 7:50 a.m. in Chicago. My good friend Mary Fiorito hosts that show, 
And uh, I'm a frequent guest, and they've actually asked me if I'd be interested in hosting. And if they give me that chance, I will. But right now, I don't have my own show. I do not have a podcast. Mm. If people want to keep up with me, best thing they can do is follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Michael underscore J underscore new. That's at Michael underscore J underscore new. Um, you know, I have commentary on pro-life stuff. I put it out on my Twitter feed. Um, you know, I also on Facebook. If you're yeah. you know, friends right. with the other pro-lifers, they're probably friends with me. I'll accept a friend request. I post things there. But that's kind of the best way to kind of stay in touch and keep up with me. Do you work alongside with Right to Life? You mean National Right to Life? Yes, sir. Yeah, I um, uh, I mean, I collaborate with them. I had the chance to speak at their conference this past summer. Oh. Uh, it was in Pittsburgh, uh, where I was born and raised. Um, I was hoping my parents could come and see me speak. Um, unfortunately, my mom had ran into some health issues, and uh, mm. dad had to take care of her, and they, they couldn't make it. But I did include a picture of my family uh, on the PowerPoint slide, so people got to see my mom and dad if they couldn't make it in person. Uh, but yeah, I've spoken to their conventions. I know the staff there well, and uh, they're, they're good people doing good work on this issue. Since Roe versus Wade was reversed, do has uh, what issues are pro-lifers facing now that Roe versus Wade has been overturned? Well, you know, Roe v. Wade, the reversal, it's created opportunities, it's created challenges. You know, right now we can actually protect pre-born children uh, legally. We couldn't do that before. Roughly 14 states have laws in place to protect pretty much all pre-born children. Another seven states or so have laws in place to protect the pre-born after a certain gestational age. So, um, you know, we yeah, sometimes it's six weeks, sometimes it's 12 weeks. It depends on the state. That, uh, it shouldn't do it at all. Really. I'm sorry. It shouldn't do it at all. But... I agree. I, but sometimes, you know, if the best you can do is a six-week limit, that's better than nothing. That does save some lives. Then you try to go back and save the rest. I mean, I think, you know, you try to do as much as you can, as quickly as you can. But you know, I'm of the opinion, if you can't get the perfect bill, if you can't save all the lives, save some of them. Save go back and try to save can. the rest. So, um, but we also are working out for us. I mean, um, you know, that uh, we have to be aware of uh, women trying to go to other states to get abortions. You know, let them know that, uh, you know, there's good resources, you know, in their own state. Uh, a lot of states are allocating money to pregnancy centers and other programs to help pregnant women. So we need to kind of publicize the resources that are available. We also need to be aware of women obtaining chemical abortion pills through I, the mail. I, you know, uh, you know yeah. they can oftentimes it's illegal, but you know those laws need to be enforced. And also, it's unhealthy uh, that uh, you know women, you know, we are upon chemical abortion pills are failed to abort children, uh, but also pose serious health risks to women as well. Uh, that if uh, a woman is in ectopic pregnancy and she obtains chemical abortion, that can be fatal. If uh, she's further along the gestation, she realizes and obtains chemical abortion, that can have some negative health consequences. So uh, those are things we need to be thinking about. Also, in completely liberal states, they're trying to make abortion policy even more permissive. You know, in the past, you know, six or so years, uh, Illinois, uh, Maine, and Rhode Island have started to cover abortion through the state Medicaid programs, you know, that's terrible. That's going to lead to more abortions in those states. That means taxpayers are paying for active abortions. Um, Illinois repealed their pro-life parental involvement law. Uh, Massachusetts weakened theirs. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have our work cut out for us. I mean, uh, one thing a friend of mine said with the Roe v. Wade, the reversal, uh, it's what's the Churchill quote? It's not the end. It's not the beginning of the end. It's the, it it's may well be the, 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 the end of the beginning. Special peaceful fight that we are doing for the unborn, newborn. Yep. And I love life from the womb to the tomb, you might say. Taking care of older people from euthanasia or suicide or whatever, you know. Uh, my heart goes out to the older people who uh, are persuaded to kill themselves because they're no, yeah. what, no good anymore? Yeah. No, I mean, you know, euthanasia is, you know, terrible. But I think we need to take care of people who are, you know, elderly. That There's ways to manage pain, you know, in a lot of cases uh, that uh, nobody should have to resort to, to killing themselves. Nobody should view themselves as a burden. I mean, life is a gift. 
and you know, we should you know respect life from, from womb to tomb. You know, uh, nobody's uh, you know everybody's won by somebody. Nobody should view themselves as as a burden. See, we're not alone in this world. We're one big human family. So we yep. should not say to oh leave you leave him alone. He'll do this, do that on his own. No, we're here. We're our each brothers keepers. Mm-hmm. And that's why we are here on this planet. That's why God created us. The Lord Himself. So I uh, am. Yeah. I was gonna ask some other questions. You be on the radio and TV and my type of yep. interviews and stuff. Yep. Of course, TV, I'm on EWTN News Nightly. You know, they have me on you know, a few times a year. I was on CNN International once. I was on Christian Broadcast News for a couple of different segments, I think. Uh, so that's my TV radio. I do a lot of Catholic radio. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm on Crest of the Afternoon. I'm on the Drew Mariani Show. I'm on um, you know, Catholic Connection with Teresa Tomio. So those are Catholic shows. Morning Air is another one that has me on. There's some conservative shows I do. I'm on uh, In the Market with Jan Partial. I'm on uh, the Ed Morrissey Show. Wow. Um, I was also on the show Issues, Etc. that's done by Lutheran Public Radio. has me on pretty frequently. So, yeah, there's radio shows that have me on for, with some consistency. So how often a week are you on? You do them from pro- your home? Yeah, I usually do them from my office. Usually right here, I'm on the phone talking to the host. Mm-hmm. Um so, yeah, usually I'm on, uh, probably that's maybe once a week, but it's in clusters. I mean, if I write something, especially something people find interesting, you know, they want me on the air. So it's, you know, probably at least, you know, I average about probably about 50 to 60 a year, uh, oh. but they kind of come in clusters. It's not like, you know. Not every day. <laughs> Need some time for work. So uh, you have written books, have you? No, no I've never written a book. But nothing published, or anything. I mean, I do a lot of blogging. I mean, I write for National Review. I write op eds. I write blog posts. Uh, I write academic journal articles, which you know, probably most folks wouldn't find that interesting. But you know, I'm on National Review online, probably about once a week, just writing about some pro life topic usually. Yes. And uh, you know, uh, sometimes it gets republished by places like LifeNews.com, uh, LifeSiteNews.com, right. yes. and, uh, and Live Action News. So. Uh, I should write a book. Uh, probably, you maybe it'll inspire should. me to do so. I think it'd be a good idea. That sounds like a good idea. It doesn't have to be four thousand pages. It just no. seems to hit it right in the nail. Doesn't have, you know. That sounds good. That sounds <laughs> good. Um, I'm have uh, myself on Doctor uh, Avita King's site uh, a song that I had written, uh, "Touch of God." I should send that to you. It's about abortion, but Jesus being there for the mother and the child. Mm -hmm. A touch of life, yes. Yes. So uh, if I could share that with you afterwards. Sure. I'm on my song and my history is on her site. Mm -hmm. So I just thought I'd plug myself. (laughs) Okay, go for it. So um, over the years, you go lecturing. At all, uh, yep, I do a lot of public speaking. Um, this past summer, again, I was at National Right to Life. Some of your viewers might find it interesting. Every summer, I teach at something called the Vitae Institute. Right, uh, the right. Vitae Institute is at Notre Dame, uh, it's a week's worth of pro life instruction. Oh, yeah, there are lectures in theology, philosophy, law, biology. I usually give a lecture on the social science. So, uh, if you uh, you know, apply and you're accepted, everything is free. All you have to do is get yourself to South Bend. They put you up, they feed you, you get to hear some good presentations, you get to meet some great pro-life people. Uh, it's a great week, and uh, I enthusiastically recommend it. And I do some other public speaking as well. I will be speaking uh, next Thursday, a week from today, uh, at the Banquet for New Hampshire Right to Life oh. in Manchester, New Hampshire. So I'm, I'm a speaker there. Also, I'm going to probably hit a couple college campuses. I think they have events arranged for me at St. Anselm and University of New Hampshire, also, uh, I guess on that uh, Sunday, um, I think take that back. I think on Saturday, take that back. I'm going to be speaking at the annual conference of the Nebraska Catholic Conference. Nice. So I'll be in Lincoln, yeah. Nebraska, speaking to uh, a, a conference run by a Catholic organization there. So uh, if you 
If anyone wants to keep up with me, uh, that's where to find me. So, um, so is there anything you would like to add to say to my audience to give them hope that there is life after? Well, it's, it's several things. I mean, well, I always tell pro life audiences, no matter who you are, where you are, there's always things you can do to build, to build a culture of life. You know, whether it's just prayer, whether it's donating money to pregnancy help centers, whether it's praying outside an abortion clinic, you know, everyone can do something, you know, and, and we all need to look at our skills, look at our charisms, find where we can, you know, be useful, uh, but also go outside of your comfort zone a bit. You know, if you ever pray outside an abortion clinic, you'll probably go with somebody, but go pray. You know, sometimes God doesn't always cause me comfortable. So we have to do things that are unpleasant or tedious or, you know, un, you know, un, or, or tricky. So that's one thing I'd also say. The other thing is I'll just you know your listeners that, you know, we've made a lot of progress as a movement. And sometimes we miss the progress we've made. One thing I tell every pro-life audience that will listen to me is that even before Dobbs, we succeeded in cutting the U.S. abortion rate by more than half. Between 1980 and 2017, the U.S. abortion rate fell by 53%. That's a lot. You know, and we did that really without changing public policy that that much. So it's interesting. If the U.S. abortion rate never fell, if it remained at its 1980 peak, you know, there'd be a million more abortions taking place every year. So yeah. because of pro-life yeah. efforts, you know, we're saving a million lives every year and sparing a million women from a lifetime of regret. So, you know, we've made good progress getting abortion numbers down. Um, you know, we have some exciting opportunities, um, you know, with the Dobbs decision. But one thing I'll say is we're not promised a smooth glide path to victory. There will be setbacks. There will be aggravation. Uh, there will be disappointments. But God is stay with it. Yeah, Sorry. God's in control. So just stay with it. Be faithful, be holy, pray, and just keep doing your job and doing it well. You know, um, so that's kind of the advice and kind of encouragement I give to people, you know, that, uh, you know, we've done a lot of good things in terms of education and getting good pro-life materials out to people. We have good pro-life websites like Life News and Life Site, Live Action News. You know, we've done well in service and we open up more pregnancy upstairs every year. Uh, pregnancy upstairs are opening well, abortion centers are closing. That's a great right. trend. So the pregnancy centers are often doing great work on often very small budgets. You know, again, I always say, you know, if you can, uh, all audiences, I say, look, find a local pregnancy center and support it. If you can only give a little, give a little. So a little goes a long way. And we've passed some good laws. I mean, we've gotten, you know, the higher you know, stops the federal government from paying for elective abortions. Again, 14 states were protecting preborn children. Uh, you know, we just have to you know, be faithful, be holy, and keep up our efforts. And uh, as I always say, if we stay the course, I have every confidence, you know, victory will someday be ours. So. May the Lord be with you. May he keep you and your family safely in the palms of his holy hands. May God be with you, dear. Thank you. And thank you for being on my show. Well, thanks, Abby. Much appreciated. Much awesome. Oh, definitely. I hope you have you back. So, uh, God bless you now. God bless you. God, I, I see everybody next week and hope you have a grand week. Ciao. Bye bye. God speed, my love. us always for the rest of our lives.